how to prevent cracks in concrete. What kind of concrete are you talking about? But I think I can help you no matter what, because really what we're talking about here is anything kind of like bench top and then everything else, which is most of the stuff from your sidewalks and driveways and structural elements and things like that. So quite simply at the bench top level, if your concrete is cracking, most likely you're overwatering the mix. Like this is a super simplification of the problem, but at the end of the day, if you could self-assess and say like, no, I'm a concrete amateur, I don't really know what I'm doing. I would hazard a guess that you're probably overwatering the mix and that is resulting in your cracking of your finished pieces there. So let's just move on from that and kind of talk about the main bulk of the, you know, spectrum of concrete applications, which is structural load bearing, you know, construction related applications. That's where we use most of the concrete. Concrete is the most widely used construction material on the planet for these purposes. So you're going to take on some of this concrete for yourself and let's going to, we're going to say like, I don't know, a slab, a deck, a driveway, something like this. What can you do to prevent that concrete from cracking? Like, let's say you're not a pro, but you want to do everything that you can to prevent this. You're doing your research and you're trying to figure out how to produce a high quality product here and you don't want it to crack. What are the steps involved? Is there anything that you're overlooking? There might be, let's run through them. So the first thing is going to be your substrate. What are you pouring the concrete on top of? And there are right answers and there are wrong answers here. And an example of a wrong answer would be grass. Grass is not the right answer. You need to remove the grass. Uh, the only thing that you should pour concrete over would be a uniform compacted substrate. Commonly you would see something like gravel, like a three quarter clear gravel gets brought in by, you know, the dump truck and then people run over it with commercial compaction equipment, like stuff that is super heavy and vibrates and causes manual compaction of that substrate. And the reason why that's so important and also why you don't want to use grass is we need to provide support for the concrete. If you do not support the concrete, the concrete will crack. If you pour on grass and eventually the grass being, you know, uh, by biomaterial just degrade and will no longer be there and there'll be a hollow void where that grass once was so there's nothing supporting that concrete that could result in unusual stress loads that could crack the concrete so we compact the substrate in hopes that it's not going to move anymore and you're even under the weight of the concrete that we're going to pour on top of it it won't continue to move or migrate or sink or anything like that because we want the support for the concrete slab to prevent it from cracking Further to this, like what if you're in a situation where you don't think you can provide what I just described with uniform support, that's where you would look into concrete columns. So you would, you would install vertical columns of concrete into the ground and then these piers would support the concrete slab itself. Like this is well into the engineering level and hopefully not the do it yourself level, but just to describe the process, that's what it would look like when you're unable to provide the, this uh, suitable compacted substrate with which to provide a um, uh, meaningful support to the concrete slab because concrete's so heavy, super heavy. Think of how heavy this is going to be. There's multiple concrete trucks involved in, you know, even medium sized concrete pours. That is a ton of weight that's going to be sitting there. And you need to account for that by compacting your substrate. And I mentioned a, a word before, I just skipped right through it. I said uniform substrate. And what do I mean by that? This is important. What if you have a big rock in this area and then some clay over here and then some like really some, some other kind of dirt over in this area and you want to pour concrete over all of that. That could potentially be a problem because let's imagine we did. We poured that, maybe we even compacted it to the best of your ability, but still as part is rock, maybe like bedrock, it's not going to move and the rest of it might over 5, 10, 20 years move, erode, things like that. So with these dissimilar substrates, we create this poor environment for longevity because the, there's not uniformity in support. Like supposing everything was just one material clay, we'll pick that one. If the whole area was clay, even if it does erode, presumably over time it will erode equally because it's just one uniform substrate type. When you are in, introducing multiple kinds of substrates, you introduce the potential for over time things to not settle or move at the same rates, which is going to put unusual stress loads on the concrete ultimately result in cracking of the, of the slab. So just compact the substrate and that's it. We're good enough to pour the concrete and it's never going to break. 
Absolutely not. This is tip of the iceberg, really. This is, I mean, this is engineering level stuff. And since we're talking about that, let's talk about the most important thing that you want to add when you're talking about concrete and preventing it from cracking. And that would be some sort of tensile strength and support, most commonly in the form of steel or rebar. Now, the amount of steel and rebar, the size of it, the grid spacing that you're going to be installing it in, those are all questions to be answered by an engineer, truly. But if you could imagine a rectangle that we're pouring and you're going to add, you know, a steel grid, whatever type of steel you're going to be using, here's something that I would want. Just a quick visual to see if maybe you're in the right direction here with what you're doing, because not everybody hires an engineer for every concrete slab they pour. Let's say I had a grid throughout my area that I'm going to pour. The outside, the perimeter of that, I would probably be running a couple of heavy bars of steel, maybe even heavier than the rest of the grid that I've made the this uh, steel support for, for this uh, concrete that we're pouring. That outside perimeter, I might put two bars of steel that are twice as thick as the rest of the stuff because that outside perimeter it's going to absorb force load, right? And so we want to reinforce it stronger in the places where the concrete is weaker. And further to that, I'll give another example. What if it's not a rectangle? What if it's got like a bunch of weird shapes and stuff like that, which could be common for any number of concrete applications? Any place where you have inside and outside radius bends, those are very likely going to experience strange force loads and uh, shrinkage during curing can result in cracking and just in general, in any place where it's not just an open area rectangle, add more steel. If it is an open area rectangle, add more steel around the edges. If it's any kind of, you know, other shape than that, add extra steel at the points where you've got tight radius bends, things like that, because these are the most likely areas to end up experiencing cracking. Speaking of cracking of the slab, aren't we supposed to like cut control joints or expansion joints into the concrete to prevent it from cracking or more accurately, encourage it cracking where we want it to crack versus allowing it to crack wherever it's gonna crack. Yes. So in theory, what you do when you install any kind of concrete slab where it's expected that it's a large expanse or something like that and it's likely going to have some sort of shrinkage and some sort of cracking, you would cut in control joints. Ideally, when the concrete's still wet, or possibly very early the next day after the concrete has solidified. And ideally what you're doing here is you want to give the place a concrete that it's weaker than the rest of it. And since it's weak in that area and there's stress is being applied to the whole thing, when it cracks, that will be the area that it cracks. It is not a perfect science. How often have I seen expansion joints cut in, even when they're installed at the correct times, and they just fail to result in what you're hoping for. And there'll be a crack in the concrete adjacent to the control joint that you allowed for. Such is life, these things happen. For the most part, if you, if you were to install these control joints in the right area at the right time when you're installing a slab, probably if it's gonna crack, it's gonna crack in these areas that you intend, but it is not a guarantee. So we talked about the support, we talked about the steel. What about the concrete itself? Like if we did everything else right, then we poured the concrete, you know, one centimeter thick, probably gonna crack, don't you think? And that's because we would have an insufficient thickness of the concrete for the application. And what's the correct thickness? Well, it depends on your application. If you're making a paving stone, it might be two inches. If you're making a sidewalk or a deck around your pool, it might be four inches. If you're making a driveway, it might be six inches or eight inches. If you're making a bomb shelter, it might be two feet or three feet thick, I don't know. That is the nature of concrete. But what you do need to have is sufficient thickness for your application. And for a lot of construction applications, kind of four inches is a magic number. If you're not putting some sort of like unusually heavy load, like anything up to like a car and over, that needs to be thicker than four inches. And everything less than that, probably four inches is going to be pretty adequate. But it also depends on the, the compressive strength of the concrete. Like when you order it or make it yourself, there's different strengths, it's different mixed designs, the stronger, the more expensive, more, most commonly. And so you need to account for this. Again, this is well into the engineering category, but in theory, that's how this works, is that the thickness, the steel support, and the compressive strength of the concrete all have to work together to be strong enough for the application that you're working on. So in short, the concrete mix design needs to be sufficiently strong and sufficiently thick for the, the application, commonly four inches in the 25 to 35 MPA would be your strength rating and your thickness rating for common concrete applications.
So what else is going to cause concrete to crack other than if we just make a mix design that is not strong enough for the application? Here's something that I see all the time, all the time. A lot of different applications for this too. Concrete slab, deck, driveway, commercial construction, whatever the case is. And then people will run conduits, pipe chases, things like that. It could be for electrical services or stereos or who knows what, plumbing applications. But any spot that a pipe is in that concrete is taking up area that structural concrete should be taking up. In theory, when you have things like pipe chases, the concrete should be thicker in those areas to allow for this pipe that's going to be taking up some room. What a lot of people do is they'll just run the pipes and in that area the concrete is thinner than in the rest of the areas and wouldn't you know it you're going to end up with cracks there. Remember the, the forced load is kind of being universally applied to the slab and any deficiency any weakness like we were talking about control joints earlier creating an area of weakness with which to encourage a crack. Well, what the heck, that's exactly what you're doing when you're installing a pipe chase or plumbing or electrical conduits or things like that, and you're not accounting for extra thickness. You can't replace structural concrete with pipes and conduits and then expect to not have cracks over the long term. So what else do you need to know to prevent your concrete from cracking? Well, here's the thing. You need to allow it time to cure. It takes time for concrete to get strong. And it's kind of a spectrum depending on your application, but typically speaking, the first 24 hours, it's like a little baby deer. It's so delicate, and a footstep could damage it. By the time you reach, you know, 48 hours, 72 hours, it's appreciably strong. You can walk on it, maybe even jump on it. Nothing's going to happen because you're so insignificant compared to how strong four inches of con reinforced concrete would be. That being said, I wouldn't go driving on my driveway three days after I poured that concrete, even if it's six inches or eight inches thick, because it's not appreciably strong yet. It's only begun the curing process. Now it is front end loaded, admittedly. It does most of its curing in the first couple of days and then kind of the rest of it spaced out over the remaining up to 28 days. But still, if you want your concrete to not crack, you have to be aware of this. You have to not apply excessive forces early and you have to allow for proper curing. And what do I mean by that? Concrete needs time to harden. Up to 28 days, up to 14 days is the point at which you'd begin to force load a slab, something like a driveway. You would park on it commonly maybe 14 days after you've poured that concrete. But wet curing is important because you're going to mix this liquid concrete. There's a bunch of water in there. We place it and we finish it. And as it dries and cures, that water is no longer there, whether through evaporation or chemical actuation. It's gone and the space that it used to occupy is also gone. If you were to remove all of that water, that's going to apply a lot of stress to the concrete. Now later, when the concrete is fully cured strong, it can absorb that stress actually no problem at all. But in the very beginning, when it's still green, as we refer to it, or just not fully cured strong yet, you don't want to apply any force to the slab, if at all possible. This is probably the single best takeaway from this video for the average person dealing with concrete, concrete applications, or a concrete slab, and you don't want it to crack. You pour the concrete, you finish it, and then it sets up, you know, overnight, this kind of thing. By next morning, that concrete is dry definitely dry. Like unless it rained on it overnight or unless you added water manually, that concrete is, and it might not be dry to the bone. In the middle, it's probably still got some moisture, but it's thirsty. If you were to apply water, you'd hear it readily absorbing that water. It's thirsty because it needs water. And if you readily supply a new concrete slab with water and essentially never let it to dry out at all, do not let it dry out from the time that you place it and finish it right up until it's at minimum three days old, ideally a week, maybe even up to the full month, but that first week's really important and the first three days, the most important. If it never dries out fully, it won't be absorbed or, or it won't be exposed to those forces until it's a little bit stronger. It's a critical differentiation between letting just pouring a slab, letting it dry out by 24 hours and the sun's hit it, it's dry as a bone but it's like at best 40% strong, 50% strong, maybe not even depending on the mixed design. And that's a problem.
because it's not ready to absorb all these stresses yet, the stress of its own weight and things like that. It needs time to get strong and it needs water to do that. So if you can just make sure to keep that concrete wet for the first three days and never let it dry out. People always ask me this question, well, how soon? When can I apply the water? Here's the rule. If the water would damage the surface, like you do a little sprinkle on a test area and it kind of washes away the top layer, too early like it could be kind of hard to the touch but water will wash away that top layer of the portland cement but that's only for the first little bit within a few hours depending on the temperature it's it's hard like i mean it's hard to the touch but if you took a screwdriver you could still stab holes in it but at that point you can probably get, begin a gentle misting of it to keep it wet and up into the point like by morning you could just have a sprinkler out there just putting water on it all the time for basically three days and if it were my slab and I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to crack, that's exactly what I would do. I would pour it. As soon as it's hard enough to start moist or applying moisture to it, I would begin that process and I would not let it dry out for, at minimum, three days. We talked about a lot of different stuff here that would prevent concrete from cracking. And right, right in the very beginning, I kind of just like said benchtop and precast and I threw that over there and then spent this whole video talking about the structural applications for concrete slabs and driveways and buildings and things like that. And all that's well and good. But that very first point that I made where I said, probably you're having a failure from having too much water in your mix on the bench top level if your concrete's cracking, this still applies at the construction level. Very, very much so. Like when you get ready mix from a local concrete supplier, probably you don't have this problem because they are concrete professionals and they make concrete for a living professionally and they supply you a high quality product most likely. If you're making your own, you could very well make the same mistake that those people working at the bench top are making, which is to say you have too much water. Too much water in a concrete mix is such, such an easy mistake to make when you're not used to working with this stuff all the time because you need a placement viscosity that's easy to work with for you, but it's not intuitive. Concrete work is hard work, and part of that is because you're typically working with a mix which is always the bare minimum wet enough to do the job because too much water in a concrete mix universally is bad and so that's why it's important to understand the water to cement ratio that's kind of like some holy grail information in the world of concrete the water to cement ratio and you want a low water to cement ratio because too much water while making it you know a very thin mix and easy for placement is not your friend when it comes to strength. And that's why on the bench top level, it's responsible responsible for so many failures, but also on the construction level, you can experience failures like that too. If you're using too wet of a mix, it's a problem. The way you're supposed to make a wet mix is using admixtures like super plasticizers and water reducers, the products that give you the effect of really watery cr concrete without actually adding too much water and compromising the strength of the mix. So bench top and construction, Low water to cement ratio, very important to remember if you're trying to prevent your concrete from cracking. We covered a ton of information here. I really appreciate you sticking around this long, but there's just so much to go over and so many different things you could be doing and different ways that you could be trying to prevent your concrete from cracking. I hope you found this information helpful. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel.